This is the H150i Elite LCD XT from Corsair. It's part of their high performance series of all-in-one liquid CPU coolers, and it's got this fancy LCD screen that can read out temperatures, pump speeds, and even display some custom images or animations. In this video, I'm gonna walk you through all the features, specs, and customization options, and I'm gonna show you in detail how to get it installed, and most importantly, we're gonna look at some benchmark results to see what kind of performance it can deliver on a modern CPU. The package is classic Corsair with the black and yellow color scheme. There's three 120 millimeter fans here because this is the 360 millimeter model, and obviously this is the white version, but don't worry, you can get it in black too. So these are AF120 RGB Elite fans, there's some Corsair branding along the side there, rubber pads at the screw mounts to reduce vibrations. It's a nice solid feeling fan. These have a speed range from 550 to 2100 RPM, producing airflow between 13.8 and 65.7 CFM. And they can drive a static pressure up to 2.68 millimeters H2O with sound levels ranging from five to 34.1 decibels. I'm just gonna move the radiator out of the way for a second so we can see what else is in the box here. Okay, so this is a splitter cable that will connect the fan slash RGB controller and LCD on the block to a USB 2.0 header on your motherboard. I'm glad they threw this in because USB headers can be limited on some boards, especially if your case has a lot of front panel ports that need to be connected. This package has the fan and RGB controller hub. It's called the IQ Commander Core, and it basically lets you connect and control the lighting and fan speeds on up to six fans. So even after we set up this 360 millimeter cooler, there will still be three open ports that we can use to add more fans to the system and still control and sync everything up with IQ. It's got a USB 2.0 connector for communication and a single SATA power connector to get everything powered up. It comes with everything you need for installation. This is a pack of screws and washers and some other hardware. There's separate packages here for mounting on Intel and AMD sockets, and it does support Ryzen Threadripper as well. There's a set of separate mounts for that platform here too. This pump block's pretty big, but it kind of has to be to cover a Threadripper IHS. The way they did the cables on here is interesting. Instead of a bunch of smaller individual cables, you have one big flat sleeved cable that has both a USB connector and a custom connector that plugs into the Commander Core Hub. And then there's just a little wire here that'll go to your CPU fan header for RPM readout. And the other cool thing is the whole faceplate or top cover or whatever you wanna call it comes off completely. You can see there's a little connection in there that plugs into the block. So with that off, you can essentially work with the cooler to get it installed without having any wires in the way. And that can help make the install a bit easier, especially for beginners. Here's the radiator. It's got some shiny chrome Corsair branding on the side there. And actually the whole thing has a shiny glossy finish. It's almost kind of reflective. I think it's really gonna stand out in any system build. It's a 27 millimeter thick radiator and I couldn't find the official fin density, but I did try to count it myself and it looks like about 24 fins per inch. The tube connections feel really strong and you can see there's some hexagonal covers on there to clean up the overall look. The tubes are made from low permeation rubber to help reduce any issues with evaporation or coolant losses over time. They're 450 millimeters long and that's a nice length. It gives you some decent flexibility to mount in all sorts of different cases and locations. The connections at the block can rotate and that's common on AIOs, but I like to play around here and get a feel for the build quality because I feel like this could be a potential failure point with any AIO just due to the amount of movement and stress that it's gonna be subjected to. The good news is there's no problems to report here. These connections are very snug. I don't feel any movement along the Z axis there and that's exactly what I wanna see. So good job there. So this is a 56 by 56 millimeter square block. It uses a copper cold plate and it comes with thermal paste pre-applied in this kind of unique looking triangle shape pattern. And those are Intel mounts on there, by the way. They come pre-installed right out of the box. So that saves you a step if you're gonna be installing on Intel. I just wanna quickly give you a closer look at how that block works. So if I pull the top cover off, and that's just held in place with magnets, comes off and goes back on really easily. This little eight pin connector here, it makes a wire free pass through connection to the LCD screen. And here's a look at the back side of the LCD top cover. Let's face it, a lot of people are probably gonna consider buying this cooler just for that LCD screen. So let's talk about it. It's a 2.1 inch IPS panel with 480 by 480 resolution and a peak brightness of 600 nits. It can display up to 30 frames per second with 24-bit color. 
If you're not a big screen nerd like me, then you might not know what all that stuff means. So I'll just tell you, those are pretty good specs for what this needs to do. And once we get through the installation process, I'll jump into this thing and show you what you can do with it. All right, so I'm installing on my open air test bench. It's running an Intel Core i7-13700K on socket LGA1700. So this is the back side of the motherboard. You can see there's some pre-drilled holes here. That's where this Intel retention bracket comes in. These little posts have to fit inside those holes and it gets secured on the other side with some screws. So you can see here, these little posts can slide up and down and that's to be able to support different types of sockets. So you can adjust those for whatever socket or whatever the spacing is on the, the holes that are drilled on your motherboard. For this LGA1700 socket, I'm gonna push these outwards towards the end because it's a wide fitting socket. And then we can just line up the posts with the holes on the board and it should just slide right in. Perfect. Now back on the other side, we have to take these standoff screws and thread them onto each one of the four posts that are now sticking up through the motherboard. You don't have to use any tools for this. You can do it all by hand. Just work your way around the socket one screw at a time and make sure they're all down nice and tight as far as they can go. Now that the socket's ready to go, I'm gonna jump over and get the fans installed on the radiator before I mount anything. This is always easier to do outside the case before the cooler's attached to anything. Just gives more flexibility to work. I'm mounting the fans in a push configuration, meaning it's gonna push air through the radiator as opposed to pulling it. When you're mounting fans, you should pay attention to where the wires are gonna be, otherwise you could end up with some weird cable management situation. Just make sure they're gonna end up in a position where they can easily pass through a routing point in your case. Each fan gets screwed down to the radiator with four screws. I'm using an electric screwdriver here to save time. If you're gonna do the same, just make sure you don't use something with too much torque. Now we can take the radiator and line it up in its mounting position on the case. There's room for, I think, 12 screws back here. It's a screw and washer combo that you use and it's all included in the box. I'm only gonna use four, but if this is a permanent installation for you, you can definitely clamp it down with a lot more than that if it makes you feel more comfortable. I'm not too concerned about it because this is my test bench and I'll have this AIO off of here after I'm finished this review to make room for the next thing I'm testing. So a few screws is good enough for me. Now with the radiator mounted, let's get the water block installed. Make sure you remove the plastic cover on the cold plate. I know it sounds obvious, but I've heard horror stories about that. You can take the LCD cover off to make it easier to handle and work with. So this just gets lowered down onto the CPU. You line up the holes in the bracket with the screw posts, and then it's just a matter of locking it down with these four little thumb screws. I recommend tightening them down in a cross pattern to help evenly distribute the pressure and spread the thermal paste. You can do this by hand or with a screwdriver. I don't recommend using a power tool for this though, just Use a manual screwdriver and tighten to the point where they're firmly secured so you don't over tighten and cause any damage. I'm gonna feed the main cable through to the back of the case for now and then take the TAC cable, which is gonna read the RPMs and attach it to the CPU fan header on the motherboard. Perfect. One other thing I don't wanna forget is I wanna attach the USB splitter cable to the motherboard. I'm gonna do that now. So this just plugs into an open USB 2.0 header. I've got one right here. All right, so now we're back behind the case. This is the Commander Core Hub. It's the last thing we need to get set up before we turn the system on. So the first thing is this end down here. This is where we have to connect the connector from the water block. Notice there's a little white line there and also on the connector cable. That shows you the orientation, so all we really need to do is line those up and press it in and we're good to go. Now the next thing we're gonna do, if we look at the other end, we have the USB connector. That's gotta plug into our splitter that we just set up on the other side. You just plug it into one of the open ports on the splitter cable, just like that. And then the other cable here is a SATA power connection. It just connects to one of the SATA power connectors coming from your power supply. I've got one right here and it just plugs in like that. And don't forget there's that other USB cable here coming from the water block. That goes into the other open port on the splitter cable here. So now we've got our hub all connected up. If we look at it, we've got all our ports here for fans along the bottom. And these ports up here are for RGB. They're labeled one through six this way and one through six this way. So we just take each of our fans and go ahead and plug the cables in. I'm gonna start with the RGB cables. There's a little clip on there that will hold them into place. It just kind of clicks in there. I'm gonna plug each one into there just like that, nice and easy. And then for the fan speed cables, it's pretty much the same thing, but on the other side. Plug all three of those into there and that's it. It's a lot of wires, I'm not gonna lie, but that's what it takes to get this level of control out of the system. 
Now, if you want, you can take some two-way tape. It does come with a small piece in the package and you can stick this somewhere on the back of your case so it's not flopping around in there. This thing is next level gorgeous. I feel like I'd probably buy this even if its cooling performance wasn't that good, just because of what it looks like. That screen is so bright. I'm used to having an LCD screen on my AIO, but this one seems like at least twice as bright. It's crazy. Once you get IQ installed, it's just a matter of playing around with all the different settings to get the look you want. So if we click on the Home tab over here, that gives us access to the main menu where we can select what we want to configure. I won't spend time going through all these different lighting presets for the fans because they're pretty much the same on all of Corsair's RGB stuff really. The only thing I want to mention is if you click on the ring, that separately gives you control over the LEDs that kind of surround the LCD screen. And you have the same presets as you do for the fans here, so um, go ahead and go nuts and configure that. What I do want to focus on though is the screen setup because that's pretty unique here. We've got some presets to choose from here as well, and what these do is they change the display animation. So you can click through these and it'll give you an instant preview of what's going on on the LCD screen. And the one thing that really impressed me here is the responsiveness. When I click on a preset, it changes on the LCD instantly without any noticeable delay. It's actually really responsive and it feels super smooth and easy to use. I really like how it works. Now within the presets, you can select which sensor and information you want to show on the LCD. So if I click in this drop down menu, this is gonna show me a list of all the sensors in the system that I can choose from, and that'll display that real time data up on the screen for me. So if I wanna pick, say, the CPU package temperature, I just click in there, and then let's say I don't like that it says CPU package. Well, I can click in here and type whatever I want. So I can just call it, for example, I don't know, CPU core. There you go, boom, instantly changes. And then you can click down here and actually change the color gradients to whatever you want it to look like, really. So you can really get like a fine granular level of control and customization on this to get whatever look you really want. It's pretty unique. Just one more quick thing before we jump out of here. If we click on the cooling tab, this has some built-in cooling performance presets. So you can pick these as opposed to having to jump in and make custom performance curves. So that can save you some time there as well. You've got quiet, balanced, extreme, zero RPM, and variable speed. So now we know it looks good and the software side works seamlessly. So the only thing that's really left to do is run it through some temperature tests to see what kind of performance we can get. Cinebench R23 is more of a CPU stress test than a benchmark, which makes it perfect for testing coolers in my opinion. This is a 10 minute straight multi-core test run, basically pushing the 13700K to 100% load the entire time. Using the quiet, balanced, and extreme presets in IQ, average temperatures on the P-cores were 82, 80, and 76 respectively. All great results, nowhere near the threshold for thermal throttling. But look at the sound levels for a second. There's a big difference between the quiet and balanced modes compared to extreme. The cooling performance in extreme mode is impressive to say the least, but it comes at a pretty hefty noise penalty. I can't imagine a lot of people are going to be comfortable with that trade-off, probably opting instead for balanced where you get a good mix of performance and noise. Exporting a 4K timeline in DaVinci Resolve, it took the system about 3 minutes to complete this task. Temperatures look great. Even in quiet mode, the average P-Core temp was in the low 70s. Cranking it up to extreme shaved off 8%, but added about 30% more noise. In this custom run a 3D Mark Time Spy, uh, well, the cooler's not even breaking a sweat, keeping average temperatures below 50 C in every test. In other words, this cooler's way more than sufficient for gaming workloads. I do think the sound level in quiet mode may be a bit misleading here though, because I ran the extreme and balanced tests first, and also the other benchmarks before this one, so I'm thinking the coolant temperature may have been a bit higher here, forcing the fans to spin up a bit faster. But still, it follows the same pattern where extreme mode adds a ton of noise in order to achieve higher performance. That was a lot of detail and information, sorry about that, but there's just a lot to cover with this one. To sum everything up, I'd say this is a high performance AIO with the best looking build and design currently available on the market, period. Can other coolers match or even surpass its performance? Yeah, probably, but in my opinion, they're not gonna look as good while they're doing it. So the bottom line then is this is an amazing cooler for system builders who care just as much, if not more, about aesthetics as they do performance. If that sounds like you, then I can easily recommend this to you, hands down. I'm gonna have more specs and details for you down in the description of the video along with some purchasing links. Make sure you check that stuff out. Give the video a thumbs up and get subscribed on the way out for more content. And we'll see you soon.